Building a product now is way more complex than building a product 10 years ago. Like the table stakes have shifted higher and the stuff that we have to do to solve someone's problem is like tenfold, you know? Like a product release now has to have notifications like you're saying. It has to have a decent onboarding experience. The UI has to be, you know, fancy. And so we have to do a lot more work to get a viable MVP up. And we don't want to sit around dealing with infrastructure for four months just to build something basic. Hey, this is Brian, and you're listening to Jamstack Radio, a bi-weekly series where we discuss modern web development with maintainers, founders, and developers. Jamstack Radio is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor and developer for startups. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter, at Jamstack Radio. Welcome to another installment of Jamstack Radio. On the line, we got Tony Holstock-Brown. Tony, hello. How are you doing? Hey, I'm very good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, pleasure. I mean, we we crossed paths at a Slack, and then we met in person, which is like every now and then people catch me from like from another thing. I guess in San Francisco, probably way more common. Uh, but yeah, you're like, hey, we're in a Slack together, and I was like, oh yeah. And then um, we start talking about your product, and I was like, oh, you should come on talk on Jamstack Radio. So want to talk about ingest, but also first we'll start with who is Tony? How'd you get here? Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hey, it's good to cross paths with you. I uh, feel like I, as soon as I saw you, I knew you, which is interesting <laughs> because of the stuff that you've done. So super fun. How'd I get here? It's uh, sort of by chance, you know? I never anticipated moving to America, kind of fell into it, um, but was always in tech. So taught myself how to program when I was a little kid. You know, like back in the day when you would download music on like Napster and whatnot? Yeah. Yeah, downloading music, like there were, there were like Boys to Men albums. And then like I saw a book on programming and I was like, this seems cool and uh, downloaded it. <laughs> so you went from pirating music to, <laughs> to learning programming through pirated books. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, um, and uh, yeah, I taught myself how to program when I was a little kid. Got really interested in, in tech and computers and sort of found my way through that as a teenager to get in a job in, in, in my teens and uh, been interested in startups ever since. So it kind of makes sense that I'm here, I guess. But um, yeah, fell into it. Yeah, and you know, I didn't know this about you, but like I saw you, you did a tour at Docker as well. How did you, mm. how'd you get a Docker? Yeah, so back when I was living in New York, we were using Vagrant for a bunch of our stuff. Okay. And Docker had just come about. It was all over Hacker News. I think they just raised their Series B or something. It's like 2014. So Docker had just come about. And it was all over Hacker News, all over these blogs. And it was talking about you can write once, deploy anywhere, or like a better Vagrant. So started messing around with it locally so that we could improve our dev flow at the company that I was at. And uh, instantly like fell in love with the tool. You know how like a developer tool comes along one time and you're like, yeah. this makes my life so much easier. It was exactly that process. And uh, knew that I wanted to work there. So I was doing something on the side, um, ready uh, for, for a different company and uh, working at a startup, but figured that Docker was the future, as it were, and ended up just straight up cold calling someone there that, that, that had worked there, being like, I really want to work here. I've written a blog post on you. And uh, like, can I interview? And so, um, yeah, ended up flying out to San Francisco, interviewed and and got there. Wow. It was around like pre coop So like... What's that? 2015? Yeah, like there were there were fewer than 100 people, but still relatively big at the time. Yeah, that's that's amazing too as well. Because I actually I crossed paths with Docker, but as soon as I started writing code professionally, or right before, I met someone who worked for Docker remotely uh, in my hometown, and uh, he spoke at a local meetup and was like, "Oh yeah, Docker, it's the greatest thing ever. You can do this, this, and this." And at that time, I was like. I had just like learned how to deploy the Heroku with uh, Ruby on Rails. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good push. Yeah, prior to that, I was like basically just doing like HTML and CSS and JavaScript. So like I didn't really connect. But then around the time you joined Docker, actually, I joined Netlify, uh, and then I knew exactly what Docker was. Amazing, dude. There's so much to talk about with your Netlify journey because like. Obviously, being Jamstack Radio, Netlify had a big deal in, in making Jamstack. They came up with a name. And this is super interesting because I think before then, developer experience hadn't been something that people cared about. Yeah. You know, like if you look at how clouds work now, AWS, it's like infrastructure. You know, you have to figure it all out yourself. You have to do the monitoring yourself. You write Terraform because DUI sucks. And, and the experience is like not very good. It's just provisioned infra. 
Netlify came along, changed this entire thing. Yes. And like, it's super interesting that you were there in 2015 because that was almost like the start of the developer cloud journey. Yeah, it's almost like you can go to this podcast and uh, find the first episodes <laughs> back in, I guess by the time we shipped, it was late 2015 and definitely check it out. Yeah, I was in the inception, the conversations in the back room around what to name this thing and what to work on and like the deploy previews. I was actually just talking to somebody about deploy previews and how that came about on a Twitter space yesterday, actually, of all places. Oh, cool. But this is actually a perfect segue because like what you're working on today, which is ingest. So like what what is ingest? Like what what's the problem you're solving? Yeah, for sure. So ingest is a platform that gives your function superpowers. Excellent. So Jamstack is great. You build APIs and the APIs communicate with your client you know, in like React or Vue or what have you. And serverless functions are really good for HTTP APIs. They're maybe not so good for business logic. They're maybe not so good for business processes. There's this big push to the edge, and that's all about reducing latency, making your users happy, because your website is faster. But if you're pushing stuff to the edge, you want your latency to, to go down. You want your APIs to be fast, and that means you need to push work to the background. And how can you do reliable background work on serverless functions? It's kind of an unsolved problem. Uh, you need to tie in different things like SQS and Lambda. You need to have like this tiered architecture where you have database state or queues. And uh, really, really difficult to set up. And so for quite some time, Jamstack has been about HTTP APIs and less building your entire business in a serverless manner. We give you all of that out of the box. So... With one line of code, you can get retries, reliable functions, scheduled functions, event-driven functions, um, any any provider. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, it's the so around the same time that we're we're both working at Docker and, and Netlify, the serverless hmm. infrastructure thing and the serverless.com came out. And I think that really kind of solidified this, but also serverless days. Like it was so much serverless, it was like. It was almost too much serverless. It's like <laughs> it was almost a meme at a certain point. Yeah. But it's also true, like building infrastructure around just a bunch of lambda functions or a bunch of serverless infrastructure, it's a it's a painful thing to manage. Uh, especially when you start you you take a, a uh, like a step back. I think I um, was it last year, everyone got the notification like if you had an old running node serverless function, you need to update it. And like in my mind, I'm like, oh man, I've got hundreds of these things. Like I'm just building projects left and right. Yeah. And I'm like, I guess these things are now going to be sunset because <laughs> I don't want to update all these things. Yeah. But it was that's how it was. They were a dime a dozen. It was like, oh, I can do compute without paying out of pocket. Like my my AWS bill has been like thirty five cents for the longest time. Right. Right. Like I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense. It, it's a super nice way to do things in theory. But like the classic example that I kind of think about is like just just something as basic as sign up. Like, cool, you can use Clerky, you can use Dscope, you can use what have you for auth, but you still need to do a bunch of stuff in the background. Yeah. Like a user signs up, there are like five things that happen, you know, send them a welcome email. You might want to add them to, to Zendesk or like any provider, Stripe. And all of this stuff needs to happen in the background immediately. And, and do you do that in your APIs? No, you want this to be reliable. You don't want any of them to fail. And so like serverless is great. Managing all of this is a real problem. And there are different frameworks, like serverless framework is, is, is great. Different stuff to manage this, but the, the, there's no like answer. There's no answer for each platform. You can't do this necessarily on, on Netlify. You can't do this easily on Vercel or Cloudflare workers. And so um, there needs to be something that fills this gap and gives you retries automatically on your functions. And so uh, also like ties in nicely with events because stuff like this is cool. If, if you have a user signup event, propagate that out to any function that listens, similar to how you do it on SNS, SQS, and then have all your functions automatically run with retries, but with no setup. And it's nice to get that where your project is currently hosted. I think like this, the biggest thing with Netlify, like Netlify has a lot in one space, you know, like deploy previews, they've got the edge, they've got different background functions. Yeah. And um, it's really nice if you're deploying to Netlify, you're deploying to Vercel, just keep that process the same and have all of this stuff in one place. Like that's kind of the ultimate dream. Yeah, and speaking of that dream, as a as a Netlify stockholder, I'm curious, like, what your uh, your take is. Like, there's AWS, which is like you, you were also glowing about how talk about Netlify's developer experience. Hmm. Do you think Netlify gets to the point where 
it becomes as big as AWS, but with just a better experience? This is super interesting. This is a $10 billion question. Right, right, exactly, exactly. It reminds me of like the classic business thing, which is like there's two ways of making money, bundling and unbundling, you know? <laughs> and there's like AWS, which is the bundled everything. There's the Netlify, which is the unbundled like cloud front, but done in a really precise manner, which is super valuable. And then you start layering on different things like serverless functions. Think like it's really interesting and there's definitely a lot of room, you know, to grow. A question is what happens with developer clouds overall, in my mind. Like the rise of the developer cloud is super interesting with Planet Scale, Netlify, Vercel, Neon, as, as if, you, if you're looking at Postgres. And uh, what happens in the future with all these platforms? How do they interplay? Yeah. Because if Netlify were to grow, then there are a few things that a full stack app needs, which is. I know you did a show on Redwood and Redwood kind of covered this in some way as well. You know, like you need auth, you need data, you need a place for background jobs slash queues, and you need a place for, for hosting CDNs and, and functions at the edge. And right now, AWS can do them if you don't mind the experience and you really like Terraform, which I don't know many people that love Terraform, but it's a thing. Yeah. Or you can go on Netlify and have... GitHub PRs, which automatically populate into different preview environments. And so I'm wondering how all of these different things work with each other in the future. Planet scale branches that work with Netlify PRs, that work with kind of ingest background functions. It's going to be interesting to see how this evolves and whether or not, you know, AWS embraces this or whether or not we all overtake. Yeah, interesting future because developer experience definitely matters. Yeah, I mean, it is very interesting too as well because I've chatted with um, quite a few infrastructure, like up and coming infrastructure projects. Which, Clerk, like I definitely want to chat with them. I, I run into them all the time with the founder in San Francisco <laughs> at random events, uh, but I've, I've failed to invite him or his team on the, the podcast. So I'll get the Clerk eventually. But no, it's it's true because like the the bundling unbundling. Like we also just talked to Pantheon recently, where Pantheon is like coming out of the Web two point arrow, like trying to get people up up to scale and like originally deploying WordPress apps, but now doing so much more. And also Google Cloud, they also are very clear about like the stuff that they acquire. They still have like their internal brands for that as well. So like they're all bundling the Google Cloud platform yeah. uh, and building that behemoth. But like Netlify is doing the same thing with like the Jamstack Innovation Fund and like all the new integrations that you can do on, on Netlify, which um I think we're all benefiting from it. Like me personally, we're we're solving problems. That problem where you talk about the welcome email. Uh, we're using Superbase for our off today. Yeah. Superbase is like also our data host. And then to be able to send a notification of like, hey, something happened, or even beautiful, like real time updates. Like there, here's a new notification of like, hey, something happened in the app, or you got a new message, which we haven't shipped yet. But like we're working on this where you can send like someone requested to work with you on open source. Here's a real time notification. Here's a real time response back. Like that's all stuff that. I honestly, not knowing Docker very well until Netlify, like I wouldn't even know where to approach that. Yeah. And now I can just be like, hey, is, is this a feature right. at this right, right, product? Right. Or is this a feature that Netlify integrates pretty well? And uh, you're right on the money where like Vercel and Netlify, I know Railway is also up and coming as well. Yeah. Uh, Render, like they're all building these nice, I don't know if they're walled gardens, they're still pretty open, but they're building these nice platforms for Developers who maybe can ship a quick React app can also ship cron to send notifications and etc. Yeah, right, right, right. I think like this is the most important thing in the last 10 years in the developer space. Is like I don't want to be an expert. I don't want to be a PhD in learning how to do Kafka topics, back off item potency, retries. You know, we don't want to do that with databases. We don't want to learn how Postgres WoW works, and we don't want to have to set up replication and failover. Um, we just want to know like I need this feature. What's the best way to implement it? And has a lot of the details been taken care of for me? Because like ultimately, building a product now is way more complex than building a product 10 years ago. Like the table stakes have shifted higher and the stuff that we have to do to, to, to solve someone's problem is like tenfold, you know? Like a product release now has to have notifications like you're saying. It has to have a decent onboarding experience. The UI has to be, you know, fancy. Thank you, Tailwind. And so we have to do a lot more work to get a viable MVP up. 
And we don't want to sit around dealing with infrastructure for four months just to build something basic. Like when this happens, do that. You know, that's kind of crazy. So I think like people learning that and the developer experience is like uh, so fundamental to getting things right. That uh, it's opened the door to a lot more engineers and what we can build. And um, it's going to be an interesting future. Yeah, it's true. Because like the... um so I, I make this correlation a lot. If anybody's heard me pitch open source, so <laughs> apologies, I, I pitch it a lot. But I make this correlation to like what we're building, which is the money ball for engineers, where if you're looking for the best talent and best skills, so if someone's c- contributed to one of these open source projects, you might want to hire them to work internally on one of your features. But what I'm getting at is like now you don't have to be like I guess on the other end of this is like now we have all these, it's like way more competitive if you want to go play pro sports. Because now you have kids who are like have trainers of all the former pro athletes training them. And you're seeing this like weird shift of like, like I'm a big NBA fan. Like every NBA player that's like came into the league in the last 10 years actually has gone to the process of like having specialized training. Where like 20 years ago, uh, like me and you were growing up, it was just like, oh, you just have to spend way too much time on the court and uh, <laughs> yeah. did a lot of practice and you became good. Yeah. And that was like, that was how you made it. You now have to do way more. Like you have to get your parents to pay for specialized training. You have to go do club sports. And with engineering, it's like that, but also not that, where like you can come out the gate of a boot camp and like just know Heroku or just know Netlify really and still be like dangerous and be able to like ship stuff yeah. within the first couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, where before it was like, oh, if you just spend enough time like reading hacker news and buying the right books and like writing the right code at the right time, like now it's almost impossible to stay up to date on everything. So if, you, if you're if you a senior Tailwind engineer, like there's a place for you. Yep. There's definitely a company out there that's like, yeah, we just need someone to know Tailwind really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's like the thing, like it's a really good thing that people can come out of just learning CS, just learning the fundamentals and be able to ship. And I think that's like a testament to the things that you did at Netlify seven, eight years ago now that Netlify has done that other companies like Vassell, Planet Scale, Neon are doing and that, that we're doing for events and, and durable functions. And I think like uh, it's a challenge that the table stakes have gotten so high that realistically people are so used to tech nowadays that they expect world-class experiences. When if you look at Twitter back in 2008, the experience was less than yes. boot, bootstrap was a big deal, you know? And that's amazing. Well, it was, it was text right. messages at first. <laughs> yeah, crazy, crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting time and uh, there's, there's more ahead. So I think that um, if we want to make it as, as easy as possible for engineers to do what they need to do, then we need to focus on the developer experience, you know? And so that's like one of our foundational things at Ingest. It's like, how fast can you learn us? How fast can you get set up right, writing durable functions? If you've never written a serverless function before and you need to do retries, uh, let's say, for example, someone was using us for OpenAI GPT a couple of days back. Let's say like you need to chunk an OpenAI request into four chunks. You want each four chunks to succeed. And then after you've done chunking and summarizing text, you want to you know convert the summary into one whole, summarize the summary as it were. Like that's quite a pain for engineers to do because each four jobs needs to be built, needs to be enqueued, needs to be durable and, and, and reliable. And then you need to know when all four jobs are done so that you can summarize the summary. And um, how fast can you do that? It turns out that like if you focus on developer experience and you make this really nice, you can maybe do that in 10, 15 minutes. Whereas realistically, if you were looking at SQS, might take you a few days to, to set up the queue, to set up Lambda, to do the end-to-end testing. And so um, we're going to have to do more as a practice, you know, as a, as a profession. And we need tools that enable us to work faster. 100%. So I, I wanted to ask, because we spent some time talking about the, the higher level and the problem, like where the state of the ecosystem is. Uh, but like, what was the story that got you into this building this and solving this problem? <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So... I'm a huge nerd, as previously explained, by downloading books when I was a kid. And like uh, infrastructure architecture is really interesting. Um, I ran engineering at a healthcare company uh, for five years prior to doing Ingest. And healthcare is 
it's complex. And events are really great in healthcare because they're kind of immutable facts about what happens in your system. Someone signs up, someone books an appointment, someone speaks to a doctor. The event that goes through your system is a fact saying this happened and it serves as a perfect audit trail. Healthcare is also complex. You need to do a lot of tedious user journeys and business practices. So it kind of makes sense to build an event-driven system because then you can hook into if a patient communicates with the doctor and the doctor doesn't re- respond within 24 hours or if a patient books an appointment and they previously complained, they might be at risk. So a lot of these things, complex state, event-driven systems, systems that we needed to build, but it's just too hard for engineers. Like Kafka's great, even if you use NATS, NSQ, uh, they're kind of fungible. It doesn't matter. The, the, the infrastructure itself is commoditized. Still building out event-driven systems is really hard. You need to build the subscribers, the workers. You need to handle dead letter queues, back-offs, item potency. It's very, very challenging. And your code can often spiral. So you spend three months implementing the platform before you actually build what you needed to build. And that's that's no good for anyone. You know, that makes CEOs annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so there needs to be a better way to do this because fundamentally it's the right way to do things. Like you read Brian Fowler's like patterns and system architecture docs. You read like data-driven applications. It's the right way to do things, but it's too complex for the average engineer. So instantly in my mind, I was like, there needs to be a better way to do things because every company that you use already uses events. You know, like you might use customer IO. Everyone's probably used segment or heard of it. You use things like Amplitude for your product analytics and it's all events, you know, like when a user does this, I want to track it. And as engineers, why is it so hard for us to leverage events in the same way? You know, like we have to mess with this infrastructure to get it set up. So like the intersection of the things that you did at Netlify, that Netlify the cell were doing with, with developer experience and serverless, the developer cloud, is really interesting because this doesn't exist for events. And so um, really wanted to make it easy and show people the power of events. That's really the mission. Like, how can you make event-driven programming accessible to everybody? How can you make reliable functions accessible to everybody? And uh, yeah, that, that's where it came from. Very cool. So, like, where in the trajectory are you guys? Like, I'm, you've got you've got a product that's live and, and ready to go. Mm. Uh, how big's the team, and like, what are you guys working on today and and next? Dude, wild, wild. The team is only four. Um, we've rebuilt a wild queuing system that's based off of this paper from Apple that powers every phone's queues. And the product like works end to end. We've got the SDK out. Uh, we we hired this guy Jack, who's fantastic at TypeScript. Uh, designer Ed, who's designed our website and is redesigning our product, is incredible. And then uh, co-founder Dan, who is also incredible. Um, and uh, the product works. You know, people are using it end to end to build out crazy systems on for sale, crazy systems on Netlify. Uh, we kind of work anywhere actually. We deploy to any cloud. We work via HTTP, so you can use our SDK, deploy your functions as you normally do, and get queues, background jobs, scheduled functions, reliable functions, step functions on any platform that you're currently using. And like people are building wild stuff. Uh, so someone was doing, yeah, chat, GPT, open AI. And it's kind of annoying because these functions have got the 10 second sign up. But we do step functions that can be parallel. So this guy like chunks his input, one event, to like 10 parallel API calls. We invoke that HTTP function 10 times in the background with memoirs data. And so each API call runs in its own 10 second time limit uh, and then once those steps complete, the function progresses, runs another step to summarize everything, which is its own 10 second time limit. And then like a product is just like powered end to end with the platforms that you have used for eight years without changing a thing, bypassing all sorts of time limits. And like if, if OpenAI goes down, which it goes down a lot, it will just like retry automatically. You don't need to build any queues. Um, so that's amazing. We like power a, a bunch, uh, um, but we've been relatively quiet because... Again, like the developer experience is so important that we want it to be really smooth. You know, like we've got ingest dev runs locally, uses the same executor that uses in the cloud. So you can test everything end to end locally, but with like a yarn dev. And like the entire process for us is is so important that uh, honestly, you're the first person that we're really telling outside. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, this is the uh, first podcast with ingest on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like we've spoken to Joel Egghead, uh, like we're partnering with Redwood to do a bunch of their stuff. Like uh, 
serverless functions, real-time GraphQL subscriptions. Um, they're amazing people, but uh, a lot of that stuff hasn't really made it out to the world yet because we're just working on it. So it's pretty early despite people using it for real things and businesses using it for real things. Yeah, and I saw the uh, the first first release was like uh, summer of 2021, so about a year have Mm -hmm. you been working on this? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it started very different. The workflow engine is the same. Um, But it was, I came from Docker, it was all Docker based. It wasn't SDK based, it was very hard to use. (laughs) And we realized that, uh, you know, the intersection of of serverless functions and events is is really difficult. Yeah. There's no way for you up a subscriber with a serverless function because it's stateful. So we need to call you. And the SDK was the way forward. So we built that in September um, and released it at the end of September. And uh, it's so much better to use. Like it's it's so good. So um, yeah, it's 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 changed a bit. Fundamentally, the, uh, the the architecture, the system is the same. Could talk about it for a while. The SDK does some fancy things. Uh, Previously, we had a DAG of steps. Now, your functions, your serverless functions that you deploy to any platform like Cloudflare kind of act as a generator. So we invoke it one time. It tells us the step that it wants to run. We'll call it a second time with the cached and memoirs data. And it will say, hey, I've run this step with this data. Then we call it again with the cached and memoirs data, which is how we bypass time limits. You can do crazy things like actual node parallelism that you could never do before. Um, so like, yeah, it's a lot of changes in the user experience. Very few changes in the product. Okay, excellent. I mean, that's a testament to how y'all build and like figuring it out. And um, getting the developer experience definitely is something that it, it takes time to get right. Mm-hmm. Um, so appreciate you you coming out to chat with me about your product on on the podcast. Uh, I'm actually really intrigued that you leverage this. Uh, I have a couple other questions, but... Um, I uh, wanted to check in to see like, if there's anything you wanted to mention first before I jump into asking more technical questions. <laughs> no, no. I think like I was really interested in just speaking to you about the developer experience, you know, because I think you were one of the fundamental changes in that from my understanding early on at, at Netlify. So it's always interesting to talk to people that you were ahead of the game with this like eight years ago, you know? So yeah, it's super interesting. Yeah, so like at Netlify, we we worked on... Uh, my first thing was just converting to React. Uh, we just knew there was like a something there to to leverage React to build out the entire admin dashboard. But the second thing I did was we helped build. Well, we made it easier to purchase domains and put domains on Netlify. But the thing I was a part of that was early was the deploy preview, and the deploy preview was the thing, the catalyst of how we got really ingrained in the React ecosystem. Uh, so, like, we shipped deploy previews uh, the summer I joined. Create React app also shipped that same summer. So if you like, if you look for the deploy a React app in 30 seconds, like that title, that that was me. It's been manipulated and updated since by other Netlify employees. But yeah, deploy a React app in 30 seconds because Create React app was so it just bundled in Webpack <laughs> and it bundled in all that stuff together, which is like now people are like, I don't know if I like this anymore, but you know, it served a purpose. Mm. And that was a post that we shipped to show that you could also deploy that to Netlify just by typing Netlify deploy. Like our focus wasn't CLI because like at that point now was like that was the the premier CLI tool that did it. And Surge was the other one yeah. that sort of hasn't really got a lot of contributions to it. But it was just really like my whole thing is if you could sell a car by getting someone in the driver's seat as fast as possible, and then they're like, oh yeah, I want to buy this car. It's the same thing with Netlify. It's the same thing with any developer tool. Yeah. Like if if your first introduction, this is what my my gripe with like a lot of Web three companies like about like four or five years ago was like, oh, you gotta like create a wallet. Yeah. It's like, why do I create a wallet? I just want to deploy a site. I want to build an app. Yeah. Okay. Create the wallet. Now you have to spend money and put money in that wallet to go deploy. It's like, okay. <laughs> so when do I start building and writing code? And uh, the whole thing is like you don't the the barrier the enter for Netlify was always connect your GitHub, pick a repo, deploy it, and you're good. Yeah. Uh, and then it was also the drag and drop deploy as well, which is like take your folder, drop it on the page, and you're good to go. And it was like even like that drag and drop in React was like that was such a it yeah. was a hard problem back then. Yeah. Because it was like a solve problem in jQuery, but we we chose React. So anyway, it was like it was just constantly trying to figure out how do you what's the Simplest time to get someone to ship a site, and like that's it. When times of value, 
Exactly. So like with ingest, it's like time to deployed function yeah. or whatever it is, is like how do you how do you get a full experience in the shortest amount of time? And a lot of times if you're if you're starting again or if you're building on top of a product that already has been around, you have to like rebuild. Yeah. And you're seeing that with Amp- Amplify, AWS CLI, like they're building in all those like those those services that get people to ship stuff faster and like AWS is okay if you don't log into the, the console anymore because <laughs> now you have a better you have a better developer experience. Yeah. Like you only get there if you like you really really got to dive in real deep. Yeah, uh, which has been a huge fundamental shift of like you had to be in the console to do anything AWS, even even Lambda functions. Yeah, yeah, totally agree, totally agree, and uh, that that's key. I think like if you're building a product, time to value is one of the single most important metrics that you can't necessarily track, but that you need to optimize for. And that's like key across everything. So yeah, like for us, how fast can you write a function? To wrap your existing code in ingest or create function and you're kind of done. Like give it the event you want to subscribe to and it will run. Give it the schedule that you want to run on and it, and it will run like reliably with retries and such. Um, like you don't need to learn anything. And, and, and that process is, is really key because, like, you look at some existing stuff that promise to make your things reliable, or like event-driven software. Getting started is, yeah, it's 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 a hassle. It's it's a it's a three-month endeavor, and so um, yeah, it's super interesting. Like a lot of amazing work. The Netlify thing with the drag and drop was huge on Hacker News back in the day, 2016, 17, whenever that was. Yeah, it was funny because around that time, Netlify was getting on Hacker News every month, yeah, um, pretty consistently, and uh, we were still like less than ten people. I think we were seven at that point. Um, but yeah, we weren't a lot of we weren't a lot of people, and we were figuring out a lot of stuff, and then talking about it and shipping it. And uh, yeah, it just takes a little bit of tenacity and talking to your users and figuring this out. And that was the beauty of Netlify is like our users, similar to how you got your job at at Docker. Like we had like some of our first engineers that after me were like just people in support channels. Yeah. Like, hey, thanks for your help. By the way, if you're ever hiring, here's my skill. And I, we hired some engineers that way, which is pretty amazing. But I did want to ask a question about edge mm. uh, compute and stuff like that because edge functions different than serverless for now. Uh, but like, do you see ingest also supporting the edge as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. So. Number one, yeah, we can run on the edge, but we can run anywhere because it's HTTP. So you can deploy us to the edge by literally just importing the serve handler that runs on Cloudflare Workers or Node V8. The way I see us best supporting the edge is actually offloading work in the background. So let's say your sign up API is on the edge because sign up needs to be fast. When a user signs up and you want to do the background work, like add them to Intercom, add them to Stripe, send an email, manage a drip campaign, you know? You want to send over one single event and then have five functions run at once. You don't want to add a job to five queues because that will slow down your edge function. That'll increase latency. And that's what this is all about, increasing the user experience. So the best way to do these sorts of things is user signs up, send an event, which is you know milliseconds. And then in the background, have your functions add something to Stripe based off of that event. Create a drip campaign that will wait 24 hours maybe on the edge as well, using ingest just tools.sleep 24 hours, and then send an email. In that way, everything is so much faster and every, everything is so much better. The experience is just easy. It's like send an event, add tracking to your app, add metrics to your app that are organized in the background. And then whenever you need to extend business logic, you can hook into that event, write the logic you need to do, deploy it to any platform, whether it's the edge or just regular serverless functions. And you're kind of good to go. And in, in that way, your API is going to be as fast as possible. And that's like the best experience. So I think no matter what happens with the edge, if you're really trying to live up to the, the best experience and, and the lowest latency, you're going to have to do something like this. It will be ingest-like because an event and fan out is the only way to make this experience really smooth. Yeah, I mean... Uh, I, I'm tracking with you and uh, looking forward, honestly, looking forward to all this sort of advancement that folks are doing on the edge and making it viable uh, to like leverage. And uh, yeah, happy for folks like you to figure this out so that I could just, you know, pay my monthly fee uh, <laughs> and like be able to have access to it. 
Classic, yeah. Well, we want it to be accessible to everybody. So the free thing is always something that's going to exist forever, you know? Um, super important. I think like that's one thing that Netlify Vercel has done really well. Just allow anyone to use it, you know? Same as GitHub. The developer experience and empowering developers is is important. So that needs to be always persistent. Yeah, 100%. So speaking of accessibility, um, how do folks get started with Ingest today? If they've, they've, they're, they're tracking with everything you've said so far, what's, like, what's the first step? Uh, first step is go on ingest.com slash docs, read the docs. It's, it's literally a yarn install and then you can create a function and then run like Ingest dev locally and everything will automatically tie together. You know, yarn dev, Redwood app, Next app, Whatever you're using is going to talk to the dev server automatically. Start running functions whenever you send events. You don't need to do anything but literally implement the SDK. And once you push that live to Netlify, there's a Netlify plugin. That will communicate with us, automatically deploy your functions to the account, and then we'll start calling your functions in the background whenever you send the event or whenever the cron schedule occurs. So super easy, just ingest.com takes a minute to add the SDK to your existing project and you don't need to change anything. Uh, everything will just work in the background as you'd expect. Cool. Well, I actually hit the uh, authorized GitHub and uh, I'll actually be checking it out because like, <laughs> we, we are actually, we're not actually leveraging a lot of Netlify functions. We do have, um, like at Next.js, we do have one API request to manage login uh, and like checking to see if people are logged in. So it's like, that's the only function we have so far. But we're doing a bunch of stuff on the, the API in in the background. Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of things that we could actually benefit today at open source. So I'm gonna give it a little check, uh, read some documentation and then send it over to the team to uh, to see if they have any interest in it. And we can sort of scope that out. But yeah, I'll have my people talk to your people. <laughs> so I, I did want to transition us to the picks. So these are jam picks, things we're jamming on. Could be music, food, everything's on the table. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'll go first. Um, so I've got a first pick, which is Good Timer. Uh, I just recently joined Techstars uh, with Open Sauce. Super excited about that. Uh, Good Timer is part of our Techstars cohort. So only twelve companies of the thousand that interview get chosen, uh, and this is one of them. And I was really excited about this because I've got a four year old, and Good Timer is basically it's this little robot. It's not. It's like a kind of like an uh, Amazon Echo device, similar esque, but you don't really talk to it. It talks to you, and it's like. Essentially, a clock that every segment of time, if the child is doing good and teaching the timer good habits, uh, it gets a token. And uh, so, when you unbox the box, it's like an experience where you read a book about a clockmaker and its new its new clock, which is called a good timer. And uh, the kid is up to like is required to teach it good habits. Uh, so my youngest kid has been teaching good timer, good habits, and getting tokens. It's been an amazing experience. Like they're about to ship like a mobile app as well um, to help track good habits and like making sure kids are having a good time. Yeah. I thought it was really clever. I think hardware startups are pretty challenging, uh, as from what I hear. Yeah. Uh, I think they've have a lot of really good traction. No pun intended. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. What you had mentioned, you had like a, a niece or a nephew. Yeah, a, a nephew, and like, uh, dude, this is so interesting because, like, I think we feel it as adults nowadays. Everything's kind of grappling for your attention. Yes, and when you're a kid and you don't have that discipline or notion of like why. Yep. You know, that's got to be so hard. 100%. So stuff like this is is super cool to actually like instill good habits in kids without them sort of like freaking out because the dopamine isn't being hit all the time, you know? Yeah. Well, that's the thing is like, so my, my kids definitely got the bad habits of like, we were very much like limited screen time folks, but then during the pandemic, it's like, oh, I got to work. Could you just like take the iPad and like sit on the couch while yeah. daddy's in a call? So like, obviously... Screen time has expanded, so then it was like, "Hey, no more, no more iPad. Let's go like look at each other in the face." Then it's like it's like a, a meltdown. Yeah. But with the good timer, it's like, "Hey, you got to teach the good timer good habits. Like, you got to be cool with turning this off. We'll get it back. Like, we've got the tokens. You can cash in the tokens for more time." And um, yeah, it's just like it's just like this awesome reverse psych. Maybe I don't know if I ruin my kid with this reverse psychology thing, but <laughs> the the sheer fact that you're teaching the good timer good good habits. Like my my kid is all bought into that. Yeah, where they're like, oh, 
okay, I, I need to teach it better habits. So I don't, hopefully it lasts forever. Yeah, but it's like, there's a couple of times we were just like, actually on Monday, they were like, I don't know, if, I don't know about Good Timer. They're like, I, I don't know if I could teach it good habits. I, I might mess up. And I was like, it's okay if you mess up. That's amazing. Like the responsibility they get from it. Yeah. Mm. Oh, and they, the best part of it, if you're having a bad time, you actually flip it over and then it stops collecting. You stop collecting tokens. So like the timer pauses. Cool. Yeah. So it's yeah, almost yeah. like a, uh, a good time Pomodoro that lasts as long as you're and doing good habits and making good choices. That is cool. It's also super interesting to hear your child be like, I don't know about today, you know, like the concern that they have for someone else, the responsibility that they take on yeah. is like, a, it's, it's so good. It's like so good to hear. That's, the, yeah, that's a good pick. Yeah, they have, they have a good team and a lot of good advisors. So they've been obviously doing a lot of research and yeah. getting a lot of feedback on the approach. And uh, I think I was very impressed with what they had going into Techstars. So it's definitely going to be good. Great experience for them. I wish I was doing way more revenue or, or as much revenue as they were doing. But, <laughs> you know, it is, it is what it is. Uh, textiles is going to be interesting. I'm super interested to, to hear how that goes for you. Yeah, happy to share all the secret sauce on that. Uh, I did have another pick, which I did learn from Techstars. So uh, what's been awesome about this experience is I got to meet the founder of GoFundMe, one of the co-founders. So GoFundMe being uh, it's like the platform for giving healthcare to the rest of the United States, which is mostly a joke. <laughs> uh, but most of the uh, GoFundMe's are basically, hey, I need the kidney replacement or yeah. uh, my car broke down. And the way they got to that point was this, this concept called viral loops. And uh, it sounds like for what their altruistic things they're doing, it sounds like almost too growth hacky. But what they realize is like when you do these campaigns, the, the campaigns need to be relevant. And um, the relevancy is like really what really turns on the viral loop. And um, so we've been actually looking at open source and trying to figure out what are viral loops in our platform that will take, okay, let's say 100 people saw or got an impression of this tweet or an impression of this experience. 10 of those clicked it. Of those 10, they did the activity and then shared it. But then the way you share it, you share it in a place that's relevant. So mm. if I want to get a job doing open source, and I got a job doing contributions to Ingest, and that contribution to Ingest got me noticed by Netlify, which now I have a full time job at. Now that story gets shared to another hundred people. Those hundred people click the button, do the contribution, and share it. So like, we're still figuring out what the actual the loops are. But like, once I I talk about the actual real variable, which is relevant, it's good to share it. But it, it also matters who's sharing it and where. Which I think you could attest as a founder getting intro to people like VCs. It is about who enters you. It is about like the timing as well. So as far as our product goes, like we're really trying to sort of pull those levers and start getting more people on the platform. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. It's almost like the is, is it like the K factor in social platforms? Is it, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, and the K factor is similar to like the R factor in disease about how fast things spread. Yes, and if the K factor is above one then like more than one person is sharing it when they receive it. So naturally it will grow. Yes. And the viral loop is about how fast you can build out that K factor and the, the levers you can use. Yeah, and that's that's also what's so important about having a, a good developer experience. Because if you get a bunch of people looking at your project and clicking it like, hey, the promise was there, but when I got there, the promise was not there. Like you do want to make sure you build a good product too as well. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Yeah, it turns out that like a... One thing that you don't really appreciate is just distribution. You know, yeah. like it turns out that distribution is so important. And like you take it for granted in the in the things that you do day to day. Like, you know, you want a new TV, LG, Sony, whatever. <laughs> They've got like distribution figured out, like classic example. But even then you look at like new things that are coming out, like how did Docker get its distribution back in 2014? You know, like word of mouth, new tech, but distribution is is everything. And like the viral loops, it makes sense, you know. It's nice and sad that GoFundMe is 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 used for such good and that people have to do that. It's kind of why I wanted to work in healthcare. And like for better or worse, you know, it's it's good that the viral loops worked to help them in a way. Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Uh so much dude. I'm gonna message you after this. Just just sharing ideas, sharing notes about sure. it. <laughs> yeah, this is cool. Hundred percent. And anyone listening, you know, hit me up. I, I love talking shop like this. It's like one of those things I don't do enough of. Like 
the whole developer experience. It's like I just do it and I talk with my team about it, but I don't do a lot of like podcasting and blogging about that aspect of my, I guess, my life. But it's like I love like this talking shop about it. I just don't think, oh yeah, I should talk about my strategy for content creation yeah. and how we were able to scale content at Netlify or content at GitHub. And um, yeah, anyway, uh, I digress. I will give you space. Do you have any picks for, for us? Yeah, technologically and then and then non-technologically. The technological pick would be OPA, Open Policy Agent, which is just a genius bit of software written by people that I'm ashamed to say I don't know the names of. And essentially, these, these amazing developers have contributed OPA, Open Policy Agent, to CNCF, I believe it is, Essentially, it does ABAC, attribute-based authorization slash access control. And uh, why is that good? Well, everyone knows RBAC. I'm in this role. I can do this. Yay, I'm an admin. Oh, I'm not an admin. You can also do that with ABAC, you know, and you give them the role attribute. But you can do crazy things with it. Like, uh, for example, at the healthcare place, doctors of this clinic should be able to see these patients attribute-based because patients have a clinic ID, doctors have a clinic ID, and so on. So you can you can do authorization that way. You can do crazy things like if a user requests access to your customer support team and they've confirmed this customer support member can have access to my account, then give them access. So all attribute-based, absolutely genius way of doing things, comes with its own little language and tests that you can write, um, super easy to integrate. Yeah, amazing uh, technologically. And I think it's the underpinning of a bunch of a new wave of uh, auth startups that are coming out. Basically, everything that I know that I've seen recently uses OPA under the hood. And um, yeah, so good. So good. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. This is, this is like the fascinating thing is like we, we started this conversation talking about like, how Netlify changed the developer experience and like now people approach like how you interact with your previewed staging deployment is like it's a it's a given. Mm-hmm. Like staging deployment is the thing you just get because you connected your GitHub repo. And now with authentication, now like I haven't actually seen this trend because uh, obviously I haven't had the newer authentication tools to come on board and, and talk through this. But mm-hmm. uh, I know like um Okta slash off zero are making a lot of different changes in their product and doing a lot of really cool things around off, uh, but also clerk. But yeah, this is why I do this podcast. I, I love talking to folks uh, about what they're excited about because then I can get excited about it without doing all the research and they just give me <laughs> the links to read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ope Op is great. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's very, very, very cool. The second one would be a book. Actually, I don't, I don't read too much except for nonfiction. Now I have a selection of books next to me about product traction, innovation, that sort of stuff. But there's one really good fiction book. Actually, I think most people know Aldous Huxley from A Brave New World, but his last book was this book called Island. And it's sort of like A Brave New World, but less dystopian. Still kind of crazy about this guy that lands on a forbidden island. And the island have eschewed the rest of the world to focus on mindfulness so there's elements of like Buddhism versus capitalism, like intention versus non-intention, presence, mindfulness versus getting carried away with life. And it's um, honestly the same themes as A Brave New World, uh, blends in so much good stuff. And it really makes you think about life, it really makes you think about just like how you can act and uh, how you go about life in general. Amazing book, like complete work of fiction. But uh, incredible, and would definitely recommend it just for the themes that it that it strikes on. Like, uh, yeah, so many powerful things in it. So, really, really good. Cool. I'm, I'm definitely going to check it out. Uh, I've got a huge, <laughs> a huge list of books I've been reading. Uh, but I, I do a bit, uh, a bit of fiction as well. Um, but I've been reading with the the kids at night, which is like been a very rewarding experience. Of like, okay, from five o'clock to nine o'clock, stop working. It's like focus time for the family. Uh, and I'm, I'm I'm allowed to go back and work after nine, ten o'clock. But like five to nine, I'm part of the process, part of the system. And uh, so we've been reading a lot of old books, like the uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. We're, we're actually reading right now. And um, I read it at my son's age. Uh, his age now is nine, and I read it I think at eight. Yeah. And so he's like not in the sort of curriculum today for his, what he's his school. But I'm like, 
hey, I've got a book for you. Yeah. Let's read it. Hopefully it's appropriate nowadays because, you know, <laughs> culture changes, but, you know, so far, so good. Yeah, that's crazy. I think, like, it's super interesting that you touched on that because, like, it turns out that, like, discipline is really important as well. And honestly, like, you do your own company. Uh, it's so important to have a life outside of that and family are the most important thing. So it's, it's like, really good to hear. And um, discipline is underrated. A lot of people think that motivation is the thing that you need in life to... Uh, to do things. And it turns out that discipline is, is more important. I think other people have talked about this way better than I can, you know? Um, like, uh, if you ever look at people's talks on YouTube, motivational talks, I think, uh, so many people have got impressive talks about discipline, but the ability to shut off between five and nine and give your family attention is huge. Yeah. It's tempting to keep going, but I know yeah. that work's not going anywhere. Like it'll still be there when, when everyone goes to sleep. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And like, honestly, what's the incremental improvement that you're going to get after doing a 10-hour day <laughs> after five? You know, like, sure, there's times in which you might need to do that. But honestly, like, you look at the negative impact that it has on family, especially your kids at that age, you know, like, the presence is time you never get back. 100%, yeah. Yeah. I've loved this conversation. Uh, definitely looking forward to st- stay connected. And the folks who are listening, definitely check out Ingest. Like this is definitely a tool that's needed in this ecosystem. So try it out, give feedback, give it a star on GitHub because we didn't even go over the open source angle of this, but mm. there's a star mm. there if, if you want to um, take a look at the repo. And I'm sure y'all, your developer experience is going to be top notch because you're, you're paying attention to it. <laughs> uh, thanks, man. And uh, thank you for having us on the podcast. Absolute pleasure to talk to you. For sure. All right, take care. Yeah, listeners, keep spreading the jam. That's all we have time for today. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at Jamstack Radio. This show is brought to you by Heavybit, the leading investor and developer for startups. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com.